Hello everybody, I'm Roxy and this is Chaotic Bibliophile. Today I bring you my June wrap-up. It will be the only wrap-up for June because although I did read a lot in June, I didn't finish many books because I'm in the middle of a lot of really chunky books. And I'm also reading books of letters and short story collections. It's completely fine as I've told you. I'm not obsessed with finishing books. My only problem is when I'm multi-reading in a way that isn't productive at all and that I can't stick to any book and I'm not getting anything out of any of those reads. Or not anything, but you know. So that was June and I do not have so many books to tell you about. I'm still going to take my time with these though because there are some pretty great books in here. However, I am concerned for my July wrap up because there are a lot of books I finished right at the beginning of July. By not having as many books to tell you about in June, I will have too many books to tell you about in July. And that is, there will definitely be two wrap ups in July is all I'm saying. Anyways, let's start with the books that for one reason or another, I don't have a copy of. The first one is Eva Luna by Isabel Allende. I don't know who translated this, so I'm going to credit the translator down below. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there is a whole issue with Isabel Allende's translations because she owns them and not the translator, and the translators aren't necessarily credited. I don't know if this is true because clearly I read them in Spanish, but if that is the case, I think that's really shady. If you know anything regarding that, please do let me know in the comments. But either way, this is my, I don't know what number of attempt at getting back into Isabel Allende. Because you see, I used to love her as a young teen. I read The House of the Spirits, thought it was genius. I then read Ines of My Soul, loved that as well. I read Zorro and I kind of liked it. It was fun, but it certainly was lighter and fluffier than I was used to from her. And then I never finished any other book I picked up by her. I even left one book in an airplane by accident, but when I found out, I didn't even feel bad. I just wanted to get to another book. I was really looking forward to this because it is her third novel. It is Early Allende, and so I was very excited and I was very disappointed by this. It was very badly written. I'll tell you what it is about in a second. And I do want to reread The House of the Spirits, but now I'm scared to because I think that book was so important for me as a reader and is so important in the Chilean literature canon. If you ever get to see the Chilean ballet inspired, it's an adaptation actually, not just inspired. Beautiful, it's magical. Again, this book, The House of the Spirit, resonates with my history and as I remember, it is supremely well written. There has been some debate about plagiarism because it's too close to 100 years of solitude. If you've read both, it's not the case. Anyways, Eva Luna is set in this fictional, nondescript Latin American village that's suffering colonization and it's about this young woman who is born with like storytelling powers. It is magical realism, I guess, but it's also a bit more mystical than I'm used to with magical realism. There is an air of exoticism running throughout this book and it is basically just her stories. It is a first person narrative that moves to third because she tells so many other people's stories. Of course, a lot of those are her lovers, especially one guy who is in the guerrilla. And it is a lot about, again, colonization and female independence in this context and the power of storytelling. And those are things that I would usually like. I just thought that the writing was terrible. There were some sentences that I rolled my eyes. It is not only that it's cheesy, if the worst thing that this book was is cheesy i still wouldn't have liked it but i could give some merit to it but other than the themes i just think the craft isn't good at all i think the character development is very poor it is also very demeaning to some characters it feels very exoticizing in a way that's almost uncomfortable and it is unfortunate because of course it is coming from someone who is chilean who is latin american but of course she's not from an indigenous population right so it feels like 
she is exoticizing these origins in a nondescript way because it's not again a specific group or country but it does take sort of this idea of latin america that feels so foreign in a way and again the writing i think was subjectively bad by the way we did an episode of pluma pantalla which is my podcast in spanish that i run with dani and i actually read out loud a sentence that i just think is poorly constructed it merges ideas that don't go together in any sense and it's just so meh so that was eva luna and i actually had a physical copy of this book and I've sold it away already. A much more successful read that I actually reviewed for a small online site in Spanish. I'm going to link that review down below in case you want to read it. Sara by Maibo Suarez. Sadly, I don't think this is translated, but out of the list of books that I think should be translated to English and other languages, of course, this is near the top because it's so good. This is about an older woman named Sarah. She's already retired. She was treated very badly by her company, a company that she was perhaps unduly loyal to. She shouldn't have been so dedicated to this company, but that was the choice she made and she thought it was the right one. And then she found herself completely ignored and now that she's finally retired she doesn't know what to do with her life there are also a lot of monetary constraints she is receiving a really shitty pension which if you know something about chilean politics it is one of the larger issues currently being discussed the pension system which is terrible and she also has issues dealing with reality so it's not just her age it's also her personality she has been very passive throughout her life. She has a daughter and she doesn't really connect with her, especially because her daughter is a lesbian and she tries to act as if she's cool with it, but at the same time she isn't. And she also has a very tense relationship with her father who's still alive, but going through a lot of issues on his own with age. He is basically senile and he has a new wife sarah's stepmother and they don't really get along either and there is this new neighbor that is young and apparently very successful that moves in right across from sarah and she becomes very obsessed with her in a way that suggests female desire but also might be just generally desire for her youth and her brazenness and it's just such a depressing read but at the same time Time. it's fascinating it's written in a third person that is so close it's almost like an unreliable narration because we see how Sarah construes reality and we understand from the dialogue and the outcomes that her view is so out of focus and it's just very sad and hard hitting but also very relatable it's a reality that so many people in this country go through and I believe in many other countries as well and it's just this marriage of form and content in a nearly perfect novella it is so good if you read in Spanish once again I urge you to pick this up because it's fascinating you do need to be I think in a frame of mind that is not extremely susceptible because it is such a bleak read it doesn't offer solutions really it doesn't offer hope I would say but it's so good. I really recommend it. That was Sara by Maibo Suarez. Then I reread Beth in Venice by Thomas Mann. And this is a novella slash short stories. I owned the complete shorter fiction of Thomas Mann in a huge book in Spanish. And I'm sorry, I can't credit the translators in Spanish because the book lists the translators but not precisely for each story I don't think maybe I should investigate that more but I will list the English language translators I used to own a vintage red spine edition of this book and I gave it away because I now have the complete shorter fiction this is a very well-known novella I think his most famous short fiction and it's about this artist who is in Venice and he becomes obsessed with this I want to say 14 year old but very young very beautiful man he's not really a man but he's you know in that transitional period called I want to say Tazio was that his name I think so as the whole city 
is becoming infected by this cholera outbreak. Honestly, I still don't adore this completely. I think my expectations for man in general were so high that nothing short of perfection would have sufficed, which I know is unfair, but there's nothing I can do to erase his reputation as one of the greatest authors of all time. I still really enjoyed it though. I got out so much more of it this time around. I think I was so much more prepared to admire all the long-winded paragraphs reflecting about beauty and art and the philosophy behind existing and creating and admiring beauty. I think there is a tad of romanticization, but not in a way that we're supposed to want these two people to get together. We sort of feel for the main character because he is so obsessed with this child that knows he's beautiful. I do think there is certain fault there in regards of how erotically charged Tatsu knows he is, but at the same time, it's not impossible that that was the case. So I don't think we're supposed to root for a couple or anything. I do think the desire here is completely sublimated. It is completely about object and art. And there is, of course, something of comparing this person to the city and the infection, the virus that is going on to, you know, same-sex desire as a personal infection. So there are a lot of levels going on. Of course, there are also a lot of very relatable things nowadays regarding how the authorities want to keep this virus almost a secret. It's just very fascinating and I did enjoy it a lot more than the first time around I read it. So I might reread it in the future and discover even more. I also listened to a great podcast episode. I forget the name of the podcast because that was actually the first episode that I listened. So I will link it down below in case you want to check out that as well. It is not a very long episode and it was very fascinating how they dissected all these themes. And of course they talked about the writing as well and translation because this is translated from German. So yeah, I think it was very successful and I'll definitely be looking forward to reading more from Thomas Mann. If you have have any specific recommendations I'll be looking forward to them and you can leave them down below okay and finally a DNF which is why I don't have that book anymore because I actually book swapped it I got hidden figures yes the nonfiction book hidden figures which I've wanted to read basically since I saw and really liked the movie I've wanted to read that book and I never bought it and now I'm extremely happy to have swapped it for this book that I just couldn't finish. And that is All My Puny Sorrows by Miriam Toes. This is a Canadian author, I think, that wrote Women Talking, which I hadn't made that connection for a reason. I don't know until somehow, somewhere, my neurons just made that connection. And I was like, oh, right. It's about two sisters, one who is a brilliant piano player, but her passion has landed her in a mental health facility. And then there is the other sister that was always in her shadow and needs to take care of her now. Both grew up in a Mennonite household, in a Mennonite community in Canada. And I thought that aspect was fascinating. And this book had me because I think the writing is also very, very good, but it just lost me. It just really lost me. It got slow. It got repetitive, it got like it was going nowhere and I just didn't want to continue reading it, that's the truth. I don't care what happened afterwards because there was no build up to anything and I love quiet books where nothing happens but something needs to keep your interest. If after three chapters I felt like I got the relationship between the sisters and I got what their struggles were. I gave it a couple of chapters to build up to something, to tell me why 
I should keep reading. Nothing came. And actually the tipping point was a chapter that started with reference to a book that I own and I really, really want to read. And that was my thought. I'd rather be reading that book. Now onto the physical books. I have Posthumous Letters from Montmartre by Xiu Miojin, translated to the Spanish by Belen Cuadra. But I know Xiu Miojin is translated to English. I know she is a New York Review of Books author. A little bit of context on the author just because I think it is very productive in this case because she is so autofictional in many ways. She was a Taiwanese author, she was modernist in her style, she studied abroad in Paris and she was very much subjected to a lot of Western literature and Western feminism and she was a lesbian. She was also very depressed and she killed herself. And this book is auto-fictional in the sense that there is a character that could be her, that couldn't be her, and it is letters, but at the same time she's writing almost as if this were a diary. It's not like she's really intending to send down these letters and the recipients of the letters change throughout the book. So it's not like a believable compilation of autofictional letters. It's much messier than that. And what is so interesting is that the author wrote these thinking that once she was done she was going to kill herself and this was going to be published posthumously. That is why the title is Posthumous Letters. It is very morbid in a way but it's also fascinating and I love this. I think this is not for everyone. It is definitely very passionate. It is definitely very unpolished. There is a rawness in this that I don't think is to everyone's taste and honestly it is not necessarily mine either always but the writing which you know might as well be the translation but I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed all the references, all the reflections on art and love and desire and of course the comparison between these western feminists. She is living in Montmartre at the time and she is having these affairs with some women who are very out even though society still criticize them it's not as violent or as awful as it is in Taiwan and one of the women she's writing to has settled for a man even though she's not necessarily bisexual is more than she doesn't want to be a lesbian or that might be a lie that might be the author's perception of the situation we don't know it's just very interesting those comparisons and it's very interesting how she's so consumed by these relationships on a personal level because I am not one of those people who are like very passionate about romance. It is always fascinating to me to read people who are so full in it but at the same time they get their heart broken and they don't mind, they almost relish it. It's such a central part of their life experience and that is what is in these letters. If you like stuff like maybe Olivia Lang or Maggie Nelson, you know, very intertextual, very much reflecting upon culture, about our feelings on culture and our impact on culture and vice versa and human relations and love. You will like this, not for everyone, but it's, it sounds like your thing. I urge you to pick this up. Women in Translation Month is coming up. This will probably be up for Women in Translation Month. So this is a good option. Then the first book that I finished in June was The Accidental Universe, The World You Thought You Knew by Alan Lightman. I will forever have warm, fuzzy feelings related to this book because I read it mostly during one day, the day I went to take an English language exam and I had had to postpone it for such a long time because of the pandemic. But it was a format that I had never taken before. I've taken a lot of English exams and actually I've taught them. One of my main jobs for a long time has been to help young people prepare for these exams. But this one in particular, I had never taken and I had never trained for. I was a bit nervous, but I aced it. And I was reading that book while I was waiting, while I had breaks between the written sections and the speaking sections. I chose this book specifically because it is a more academic 
but you know, a public tone so I could read this and sort of prepare my brain for fancy vocabulary and complex sentence structures. Is that too much of a dorky thing to do? Please let me know. Anyways, this is a collection of essays all about, I want to say, not theories or yeah, so some facts of the universe as seen by a physicist. Alan Lightman is a physicist. He's also a fiction author. He wrote Einstein's Dreams, which is a novella I really, really like about different dreams that Einstein has while he is coming up with his theory of relativity. I was really looking forward to this and I enjoyed it, but I think I should have definitely read it when I got it because at that time I knew much less about physics and I'm not saying I'm an expert, but you know that one of my favorite 2019 books I want to say was Lost in Math. That book taught me so much about physics that now everything that is very surface level, idea level, I already sort of know and the tying that to daily life I thought was fine but not mind-blowing, you know what I mean? My favorite essay was called The Spiritual Universe. I know because I have it marked but I don't remember what it is about. So I think that can tell you my general relationship to this book. I think it's a great gift if you know a teenager, for example, or even an adult, but someone who is just getting into physics and thinking about, for example, philosophy of science or broader ideas of science, so not just the hard science itself. I think this is a great present, so I will be pushing this into a lot of people's hands. It's just that for me, it was a bit introductory, but still a great read and Alan Lineman does write very well. I nearly choked. <sighs> Moving on. I finally, finally read Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson. This is a Spanish edition that I got in Spanish specifically so my dad could read this. It's translated by Jordi Ainaut y Escudero. I love this basically. It is a biography of Leonardo da Vinci focused on analyzing his image as someone who was much more than a painter. And I think we all know he was more than a painter. He is known as an engineer and he did a lot of physiological studies. But here, Walter Isaacson really challenges these ideas of genius and where it comes from. He sort of grounds it in a capacity for curiosity. He also paints a really vivid portrait of society at the time and Leonardo's relationship with society. He also talks a lot about his sexuality and his charisma as a person and his personal relationship without ever feeling gossipy or exploitative, but also links it to his occupations because job and life are so tied. Biographies, especially biographies of people who have had such an impact in one very specific area. I think it's hard to visualize the human behind that. And here he treats Leonardo as a human. He also talks about how he got bored of certain things or how he didn't necessarily want to paint certain things and that people might say it's a shame that he didn't complete these works, but it wasn't because Leonardo couldn't, it's just that he got interested in other stuff. So it's just fascinating. It is also very readable. It is organized into chapters and micro chapters with subheadings. Walter Isaacson managed to put everything together in a narrative that is so complex and at the same time is so coherent. And there are also a lot of full color illustrations, which is always pleasing. So when he talks about the most important paintings and the sketches, you can go and see what he's talking about. And I think that really enriches the reading experience. So I really, really enjoyed it. I really recommend it. And I will be reading more by Walter Isaacson in the future. Okay, it's gushing time. So you may have seen my Danny Picks My TBR video. If not, I will link it down below and in the IS always, so you can check it out. We had so much fun filming this. I finished two of those books in June. I finished one 
the first of july and then the others i finished near the end of july so you will definitely hear about those in my july wrap-ups which i promise will be up soon there's just been so much going on but but i am catching up slowly but surely okay two of those books were sharp by Michelle Dean and The Matisse Stories by A.S. Bayad. I'll start with Sharp, which is a nonfiction book subtitled The Women Who Made an Art of Having an Opinion. It is a collective biography of American writers who were critics and were often really polemic and sort of became the epitome of what we think now of the female American critic. It is fascinating. I think these women are fascinating. I also love that it starts with Dorothy Parker, which we could consider the OG American sharp woman. And it finishes with Janet Malcolm. It talks about Joan Didion, Renata Adler, Susan Sontag, Mary McCarthy, etc. It's just so, so good. I will say though, a couple of caveats. It is a very light book. I missed a bit more incisiveness because in the preface and in the afterward, Michelle Dean really throws it all at you in a way that was so wonderful. And I hope there was a little bit more of that in the biographies themselves. They tend toward the superficial. They are still very effective and they do talk about their lives, their works and their cultural context and how they were in conversation with each other. But if you read the preface or then you read the afterword, you realize Micheline has so much more insight in her and I think she might have been counseled to keep this lighter so that was not disappointing but it's not necessarily the choice that would have made me happiest however if this makes the book more accessible to more people then so be it i think you will love this if you like american essayism i will say though that this is very very american it talks a little bit about britain but it's always in relationship to the u.s and it's also very wide. But Michelle Dean does acknowledge that and there is a chapter about Zora Neale Hurston. Dean talks in one of the chapters and at the end. There was so much going on with the Harlem Renaissance and that sort of journalism and that another book should definitely explore not only that but also how neglected that was in mainstream American society but precisely because she's talking about the mainstream she didn't make a wider space for it, which I think is a totally valid choice. I think she owns it. And again, what is delivered is a very cohesive, very entertaining, but also insightful and interesting book. It also links all of these women into feminism because not all of them were feminists and some of them were actually very anti-feminist in a way because a lot of the times they were individualists and there is a bibliography in the end, so you can read these women directly. They are also aptly quoted, so I think that was also very successful. I just think it was such a great book. I really enjoyed it. I will read it in the future, and I think a lot of people will get a lot out of it. Then, The Matisse Stories by A.S. Bayat. This was not what I expected at all. For some reason, I thought this was going to be Matisse historical fiction, but it's not. Three stories all about art and Matisse is involved, but it's not him, it's his art. In all three stories, there are pieces by Matisse and they have a really important significance within the story and they move the plots in many ways. I adore this. A.S. Bayat is a new fave of mine. I think my plunging into her was so slow because Possession is such a slow going book, but I deeply enjoyed it. It's just that it's a very dense book. The important thing is that I love how she writes. She is very academic. She is very reflective. She has very dense ornate prose and she is all about art and the individuals and individual relationships and our relationships to ourselves and to art. I don't think all the stories are perfect. My favorite was The Chinese Lobster, I think, but all of them were great. I need to read more by A.S. Bayad. I think she's exactly my jam. I don't think she's for everyone. It's not one of those authors that I will ever say, everyone needs to read this, but exactly the type of book for me, so smart and they're so stimulating, but they're also so fun to read. Yeah, I really love A.S. Bayad. Uh, you will see more A.S. Bayad in my life because 
she's great and she's exactly up my alley so if you like all the things that i've said and you think you vibe with my taste you will like her as well a book that i am telling everyone to read and a book that is so far my favorite fiction book of the year which i already mentioned in my mid-year freakout tag lina meruana's nervous system translated i want to say by Megan McDowell. It came out this year in English. This is just so good. I think it's nearly a perfect novel. I think it's amazing. It's about Ella, a woman who is failing to complete her PhD in astrophysics and she is an expat. She lives there with her... I never remember if it's specified whether her and the man who here is called El are married or are just in a long-term girlfriend-boyfriend relationship. And I don't know if it's because it's not mentioned or because I forget. She has had a very tense relationship with her dad, who is a doctor, a medical doctor, and her stepmother and her siblings. And she also has a tense relationship with the memory of her mother, who died from a disease. And it's all about the physical ailments meeting our psychological ailments and how those are merged. I am in awe of this book. It is very fragmentary in style. So if you just see the paragraph, fragments, fragments, fragments. It is also very dense at times because you don't necessarily know if what's happening is actually happening or it's the protagonist's mind that's conjuring this ailments and these memories and it's very jumpy in time and yet it all makes sense it is a riveting read it paints a picture so vividly that all of the characters are actual people even her weird siblings that you don't know what's going on with them really because the protagonist herself doesn't know and all these people are very unknowable to her but even through that you still feel that they are unknowable in the way that all people are unknowable, but they are real people. I don't think I've ever read a book that is this fragmentary and at the same time that I feel that all the characters in it are so real. I think what comes close to it is The Friend by Sigrid Nunez in the sense that it is a very fragmentary narrative with a lot of reflections on life and writing, but at the same time, I feel that the protagonist and her friend are real people but that is the thing those are only two characters here we have a whole family worth of them and yet it works when it talks about the ailments of the father and the boyfriend slash husband you think it's a distraction but it's actually not and it all makes so much sense it's just so tight it's definitely one of the best books I've read in my entire life and as I'm speaking I know I need to reread it because I didn't mark anything because when that happens I just want to read the book and then I'll dissect it more so there are a lot of things that I'm sort of flying over the way she handles the metaphorical with the physical and she merges the things and it comes out as such a riveting well-written narrative that is also about actual people but it's also investigating language and the limits of language to describe experience it's just how how did you do it lina meruane she's so good oh my god this is my second lina meruane it won't be my last it's just so good honestly please read it please pick it up i'm so happy this is translated into english of course i talked about lina meruane in my five contemporary italian authors which i will link down below and in the eye as always but i had read this yet at that time and seeing red is really good and i actually do recommend you start with that one because it is good but it's not as amazing as this one and so i think it's the right trajectory to go from a book that is still five stars to one that is five infinite stars you know what i mean so yeah that was all i finally finished telling you about these books i am in such a great mood after telling you about them i think i read so many great things in June and I only had one DNS and one disappointing read. Those are great stats. I'm really looking forward to telling you about my July books because I've also been reading so many great books. Full disclosure, I'm filming this at the end of July, so 
Anyways, tell me what you've been reading. Tell me, have you read any of these? And do you want to read them after hearing me talk about them? Please leave me any and all comments down below. I always happy to read them. Subscribe, give this a like. My social media is linked down below. Come hang out. I am using my bookstagram more and more these days. I'm still not uploading a lot to the feed, but I do a lot of stories. I'm trying to do more of that. This is what I'm reading. Let's chat about it over there. So that is all. See you next time.